Carol. We have Carol, who is the only professional in this group, and yet she ends up with a handle, because of her professionalism, as known as the Blonde Bracero. You know, do any of you remember what Braceros were? That's, you know, that's how long Carol's been doing this. So Carol, you were like a young lass when you got interested in wine. It was kind of like almost accidental, and you had, like many of us, the European experience, but it was different, right? Yes, I did. Uh, when I was 15, my parents said, we're moving across the country from upstate New York, where I grew up, and uh, we're going to go to Africa on the way. <laughs> kind of not really on the way from New York to California, but we started our tour in Paris and then completed our tour of Africa in Greece. So it was a lovely sojourn and then drove to California and started another life there. And Zinfandel was not the first wine you tasted. No. When I was in Paris the first night, <clears throat> we went to... At 15. At 15. I had had a few Cal or New York wines along the way, but I'd never really had real wine because New York was still based all in Native American varietals and uh, not even hybrids yet. And so um, we had champagne, French champagne, at the Moulin Rouge. And uh, I was so enamored with the wine. I was just fascinated with it. It was real wine, and I was really enjoying it. And it took me quite a while to realize that the women didn't have any clothes on. I, <laughs> <laughs> I still have the cork. <laughs> I don't think that was my experience when I was young. <laughs> now, if they'd been Chippendales, I don't know. <laughs> that would have been good. So, um, so you... Um, you ended up having some older sisters who, uh, who went to school and studied liberal arts, and, um, and you wanted to study something besides winemaking, didn't you? Yeah, I actually wanted to study language. I was really into Latin, French, Spanish, English. I get them a little confused these days. It kind of yeah. comes out as a big mixture of franglais, fraspagnol, and whatever else. But I also wanted to study poetry under Robert Frost. And uh -huh. he died when I was in high school, so that was a bit difficult. Good going. And my parents were saying, phew, because... You'd be speaking an iambic pentameter now. I would. <laughs> You'd be taking many roads not taken. But um, we, my parents told me that uh, we have paid for three liberal arts degrees with your older siblings, and none of them have jobs. So we would like you to take something in the more technical range and... Uh, maybe you'll get a job when you get out. And my mom said, look at the food profession. I was taught to cook from the age of three or four because my mom didn't know how to cook when she got married. So she made sure we were all cooking very young. And she said, look at the food profession. You'll always have a job and you'll always eat. So uh, I went that way and said, you know, wine, this is the most creative science. It gives me a chance to mess with things artistically, subjectively, but also do a lot of science and uh, entertain my little analytical side because I'm kind of a classic Gemini at the arts and sciences fighting each other. Fantastic. And then you, uh, so, so you ended up in winemaking, but you didn't, you just didn't walk into Davis. You went someplace else mm -hmm. first. You, were, you told me that you were enamored with aromas and bouquet. You walked into Sebastiani <laughs> and what happened? I took a tour of Sebastiani as a freshman because I still had not declared my major. I was still hoping I could convince my parents to let me study poetry. And I took a tour of Sebastiani where all the, the big tall casks are carved on the faces. And uh, just walking in the room, the aroma of oak saturated with red wine. I said, I want to smell this at my job for the rest of my life. And I do. <laughs> Although it becomes like your perfume. You don't smell it so much anymore walking in the room anymore. But. <laughs> so you, uh, you went to Davis, and uh, your class had some interesting folks in it. Uh, what, who else was, uh, you know, learned to make wine in that class? Oh, we had a, a real who's who. Uh, we had Doug Nall, John Konksgaard, um, John Williams from Frog's Leap. Kathy Corison was one of the only other women that graduated. Kathy and I were among the first dozen or so women to graduate the wine program at UC Davis. And, um, yeah, it was... Not easy coming out of Davis um, as a woman because they wanted to pigeonhole you either in the lab or in the sales area, and you were really not invited to go into the cellar. And in fact, in many places I had gone um, in my early career, there were people in the cellar, largely men, mostly all men, who said, um, women aren't allowed here because they carry yeast infections and you could infect the wine. <laughs> that was a serious belief. <laughs> 
I think it was meant to Whoa. keep us down. <laughs> Uh, Candida, Candida albicans of one. That's a really interesting <laughs> disease. I mean, like, oh, right. Yep. Yep. So, uh, but, but you managed to infect lots of sellers along the way. So, uh, <laughs> so where did you work, Carol? <laughs> Which one should we avoid? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. They're better because of it. <laughs> no, I, I, right out of school, I worked at Robert Mondavi doing small lot research and then I worked in Australia uh, for Peter Lehman at Saltrams in the Barossa Valley. And then, because uh, you could do spring crush, that way I could get two crushes in one year, a little overachiever. And then I came back and worked at United Vintners in Madeira, very large factory. You literally used a golf cart or a bicycle to get from one side to the other. That'll take the love out of winemaking. Uh, it sure as hell and that's And that's where you became the blonde bracero, right? Yes. <laughs> Well, you remember well. Um, I uh, was doing small lot research again, and what that meant was I would do everything from picking the grapes in the vineyard. That's what a bracero is. It's a farm worker, essentially. So um, in order to make sure that we got the grapes that were designated for our lot, I was the one picking them. And uh, we would turn them into five-gallon demijohns, and we had hundreds of five-gallon demijohns and carried them all the way through to bottling. But I left before I got any of the results because I was offered a, a nice job in the North Coast, a real winemaking job at Buena Vista. And I was lucky enough to work with Andre Chalachev there. He was a consultant. He spread his influence and his love of wine everywhere. He did. He really uh, did. And he was very exciting and enthusiastic about wine. Um, uh, he was also, did he ever hit on you, Carol? <laughs> Yes, he, he was, did. <laughs> he, he, was, he was known to be sort of a ladies' man. Yes, I, not quite as bad as Mike Gergich, but he... Uh, <laughs> Mike will actually feel you up, <laughs> still. <laughs> but Andre would come, he's shorter than I am, and, and I'm five foot and a half inch, and Andre was about four foot ten or eleven, and he'd come into the lab, and, and he'd say, how are my ladies in the lab? And I'd say... Um, I'm the only one here. <laughs> and he said, no, no, not you. The girls are in the vineyard. The ladies are in the cellar, the grapes, the wines. So the girls are the grapes and the wines are the, are the ladies. He was also an obsessive smoker. Mm -hmm. He always had two cigarettes going at the same time. And yep. It was like pretty remarkable. Yeah, he would yeah. go over to the window, puff, 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 come back and taste. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So you, uh, you, 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 you did really well at Buena Vista. You liked it. And then you moved on. And how did that happen? How did you end up going to um, the Windsor area? Well, I was offered a job at Rodney Strong and Windsor. At the time, it was not called Rodney Strong yet. It was 1980, uh, 81 early. And uh, they did not have the Rodney Strong brand. Rodney Strong was the figurehead winemaker of the brand. But uh, they were called Sonoma Vineyards. And he created Windsor Vineyards first, and it was entirely direct to consumer through three tasting rooms, New York, Tiburon, and, and uh, so at the winery. And then um, all this personalized labels, which came about because people wanted him to hold wine, so he'd put their names on the labels and stash them away. And then they would come and pick them up, and their name would be on there. So that became a big gig for Windsor. And um, when I started at Windsor, it was myself and Rick Sayer doing both the two brands together. And then in 1990, when this picture was taken, actually, um, they split us a little bit. We were at the same facility, but Rick was in charge of Rodney Strong, which had been created in 1983. And uh, I was in charge of the Windsor brand. And I inherited about 25 different wines to bottle. And by the time I left, there were 48 different wines. <laughs> I did it myself. <laughs> I really screwed myself. Um, I got really excited about a new vineyard or a new varietal, and I'd go to the marketers at Windsor, and I'd say, you know, I've got this Carignan vineyard. Please don't make me blend it out. I know it'll shine. It's going to sell. And they'd let me bottle it, and it sold out in two months. And they went, oh, okay. What's the, other, what's the next suggestion you have? So I ended up making seven different Chardonnays, seven different Cabernets, um, this was before a lot of vineyard designates. Rod Strong was actually one of the first people in the whole Americas to call a wine by its vineyard designated name. So um, we eventually ended up making all these different wines and just who I am, I didn't want them to taste alike. I really wanted to show what each vineyard could do so I would adapt my winemaking to make the vineyard shine. So that's where I really gained my chops, I feel. Davis was lovely. It gave me the background. 
and it gave me the troubleshooting ability. But what it really did at, at Rodney Strong and Windsor was teach me how to blend and yep. create these different stylistic choices. So typicity for you is a really big deal. Uh, so what do you think about? How do you, how do you get there? I mean, you know, we all make wine, you know, but we have to think of the vineyard first, or at least I do, and I know you do. So what do you, how, do you, how do you make sure that the vineyard shines and comes out first? A lot of it is picking it a lot less ripe than some people do. So I'm aiming at 24 and a half to 25 and a half. And uh, what I find is the thing that most neutralizes the difference between vineyards is too high of a sugar at harvest, which means too much alcohol, too much residual sugar in the wine, and too much oak. They flatten out any differences in terroir at all. So I'm aiming at a little lower sugar at harvest than some people, and I keep my alcohols in the mid-low 14s for the most part, and my oak is predominantly more used, and I have um, about a third new usually, and I split it between French and American. So um, as the winery's grown, I've been able to afford more French. So we're tending to head a little bit that way, but... So you know, so you worked with all these other people. You just about got killed in uh, the United Vintners in terms of love of wine. Um, and you uh, did the whole thing at Windsor and uh, did quite well. I mean, you, like, you, were, you, know, you were considered to be one of the great winemakers of California. Uh, and, uh, and you got married to Mitch in, like, what, 1984? Was that right? And we met in 84, and we got married in 88. Yeah, we lived in Sin for so, four years. So, so Mitch is about uh, three times taller than you are. Yeah, he's you here know, somewhere. He's, he's, a big, he's a big guy. <laughs> he's six um, foot five. <laughs> and uh, so Carol would come home um, from her job every day, and she'd have a certain number of complaints. And finally, Mitch became the enabler. And what did he say to you? He said, get your ass out of Windsor. <laughs> You're never going to be appreciated for what you do because I was always, in many people's minds, the blonde bimbo in the lab. And uh, they didn't realize that I was the one that was creating the wines. Windsor was winning more medals than anyone in the country for 15 years in a row. And that was documented. There were a number of little books that track competitions. And every year we'd come out, yay, we did it again. Um, and I was winemaker of the year three, four times, whatever. But... Everyone assumed that it was because Rick was making the wine still, and I'd been doing it for 10 years, and 10 years before that. So it was uh, something that I was not being appreciated, and the corporate crap that you have to take working for a large company, whether it's a winery or any other kind of business, just I'd had it up to here. And uh, Mitch said, it's time. we got to get out and let you shine and let you do the right thing. So he's been my strongest supporter. Uh, his biggest complaint is that we didn't do it soon enough. And uh, I was rather attached to Windsor because I had a great sales team there. We had a lot of telemarketers, over 100 telemarketers. And um, they loved selling my wine, so I, they tell me it, I made it easy for them to sell. So when I walk into the room, I got a standing ovation before I opened my mouth. And that was kind of hard to leave. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you basically traded corporate uh, BS for um, small winery penury, you know, you you um, you found you began to find out what it was like to uh, start a small winery. So you started this little winery, uh, and you made these wines, and um, and it, I understand you owe Zap a debt of gratitude. I sure as heck do. Uh, <clears throat> people always ask me why I chose Zen, and one of the reasons was Zap because I had a ready-made marketing organization right here, and uh, in our first year. When I left Windsor Vineyards, um, it was the turn of the century in 1999. I went to them and said, I think I'm ready to leave and do my own thing. And they said, oh, good, let us help you. Give you money. I went, what? I'm telling you I'm leaving? And they said, no, we're going to sell the winery. Windsor Vineyards is being sold to Behringer Bloss. And you're not going to be the winemaker anymore. And we knew you weren't going to like that. So we were wondering how to tell you. <laughs> so they gave me a very nice severance. And it bought all my grapes and my barrels and my custom crush fees. Because, of course, when you start out, you don't have a building or any place to do it. And uh, I did a big, fancy business plan, something I'd never done before. And uh, made my own S-Corp, did all the legalities, trademark names, all kinds of stuff. And uh, suddenly it came around to bottling. We'd been hemorrhaging money because small wineries cost a lot more than big wineries. And I didn't have enough money to buy my glass. So I brought samples to Zap, and I sold futures. So anybody that bought futures of my wine 
you paid for my glass. <laughs> Everything in this winery, we've never gone out and gotten a loan till about 10 years in. We've been doing it for 17 years now. And uh, we put all of our profits back into the winery to grow. So where we started at about 1,800 cases, we're now 18,000 cases. And um, yeah, it's, it's all due to good crowds at Zap and appreciation yeah. from people like you. So, Carol, are you paying yourself a salary yet? Finally, last year. <laughs> yeah, we took out just enough to pay our mortgage at home, and, and that was about it. So we kind of lived on some savings. Yeah, you know, the things you do for love. Yeah, yeah it's pretty amazing. Yeah, so, um, so you're doing single vineyards now, you do, and you have, um, you have great names for them. You don't just call them the name of the vineyard. You kind of, like, create something more. So there's things like Munga. And uh, Rocky, yeah. <laughs> and you know, you, you know, they all have these kind of like springy names. Uh, and so, t tell us a little bit about that, and uh, tell us about your wines. Sure, um, we make the Wild Thing, and that name came about because I was doing yeast trials, which was something that Windsor allowed me to do a lot of experimentation. And one of my trials was to not yeast, and then I would use various commercial strains of yeast, compared them, and I convinced Windsor another new skew for them to sell was the wild thing and uh, they put it in little tiny print wild thing on the label and we had been talking about it we said you know top the barrels that were yeasted with this and top the barrels yeasted with that and top the wild thing over there and everybody laughed thought it was funny because of the song and the baseball player and whatever so we ended up sticking it on the wine and then when i left i took it in my severance agreement and it was the first thing that we trademarked and uh, so that's our main wine, and it's 10,000 cases. But um, Mangazin comes from Cucamonga. Rocky Reserve, which you have in front of you, is from Rock Pile. And uh, I was blessed to have a good friend, Kent Rosenblum, who was starting the Rock Pile Appalachian and needed the support of another winery to show that wines were different from Rock Pile versus Dry Creek down below. And uh, the first year out, my 2000 Rocky got a five-star gold at the Orange County Fair within a week or two of bottling. <laughs> and um, we did really well with Rock Pile ever since. And we all agreed that in order to get the appellation approved, we would not put the name of the appellation in a trademark name, because they won't then allow it to be an appellation. So I called it Rocky Reserve as a short for Rock Pile. And also because I had a rocky start to the winery, I had another vineyard that was, I was committed to buy and my grower wasn't as committed. Her ex-husband had sold the fruit to somebody else, and I didn't know until early August when I called up Kent and said, hey, buddy, you got five tons that are really cherry I can use? And uh, he stepped right up and offered me some rock piles. So um, I was in on the ground floor of that founding of that Appalachian, thanks to Kent. And so these two wines are the 04 and the 14. Um, there, I decided to show you a 10-year gap. My wines tend to age very well, and uh, they get a little bit perhaps more European tasting, a little earthier, um, more integrated when they get older, as all red wines do, but um, they stand up quite well. They have enough acidity and enough low alcohol that they age really well. So that's the difference between the two. The only other difference, um, they're the same vineyard, the same, pretty much the same vinification method, um, but the 14 has about 14% Petite Syrah blended in, because Jack Florence found a little acre that he hadn't quite planted yet. He's cleared out the, the brush and planted me an acre of Petite. So that's blended the, in. The magic Zinfandel, mate, that Petite Syrah. That's Carol, right. thank you very much. Thank you for welcome. what you do. You know, you know, keep up Procero-ing. You're doing a great job. Thanks. <laughs>